Hi, I'm Xavier McFarlane, and welcome to the Catholic City Podcast from the Mary Foundation. Today's episode features Vinnie Flynn, who will be sharing seven little-known secrets of the Eucharist. A must-listen for Catholics and non-Catholics alike, Vinnie's style is riveting, insightful, and inspirational. You will never experience this most important sacrament in the same way again. But first, if you ever considered becoming a Catholic or are a Catholic seeking to deepen your relationship with Christ, please visit us at catholiccity.com to order our Catholic scapulars, books, booklets, relic prayer medals, and best-selling novels by Bud McFarlane. Sign up for Bud's twice-a-month Catholic City email message, where he's been sharing profound insights, sage advice, and crazy stories for over 25 years. We are also the world's largest distributor of the Purple Scapular, given by Mary to the approved French mystic Marie-Julie Jehenny in the late 1800s. You can learn more at our website, catholiccity.com, which is the online home of the Mary Foundation. Since the dawn of the internet, we've been a world leader in delivering proven, free, or low-cost tools for evangelization right to your door. And now, let's begin. My goal right now is that each one of you will find that after this talk, your life is completely different. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, very serious. I know that's a modest goal. <laughs> but that is my goal that your life will never be the same, that you will never be able to look at the Eucharist in the same way again, that you'll never be able to go to Mass in the same way, that you'll never be able to receive the Blessed Sacrament in the same way. It'll all be different for you. That's my goal. So the title of the talk is The Seven Secrets of the Eucharist. It's based on the book by the same name, Seven Secrets of the Eucharist, published by Ignatius Press. Uh, There's no real secrets. These things that I'm going to be talking about have always been at the heart of the church. When Pope John Paul, for instance, writes about the Eucharist, he uses some interesting words over and over again. Words like rediscover, rekindle, which suggests that it was discovered before, but it has to be discovered again. Rekindle as a fire that was started, but it's going out. It needs to be started up again. There's no secrets that I'm going to reveal to you today. But there may be things you've never heard. Or that you haven't heard at the right time or in the right way or at the time you were ready for them. These are truths that have always been taught by the church. They've been kind of hogged by the saints and mystics and the theologians. And, you know... We average folks, at least I'm an average folk. I never got a lot of it. I don't know whether it wasn't preached from the pulpit enough or whether I just wasn't getting it. But there are a lot of things about the Eucharist that never clicked for me. I thought it was about receiving communion. Anybody else ever think that? The Eucharist. Oh yeah, every Catholic knows about the Eucharist. I'm a good practicing Catholic. I receive the Eucharist, every Sunday. Or maybe I I need more than that. Maybe I receive even daily. The tragedy is I can receive the Eucharist every day all my life and not necessarily get any closer to God. That's the reality. That's the reality. That's a choice I have. And I need to be taught that. I need to learn that and learn that a lot of it depends on me. Remember the story of the two men uh, on the way to Emmaus walking the road after Christ had died and they didn't know what was going on. They're all confused. They're depressed. And suddenly the stranger shows up and they're walking with him. They walked with him before. They listened to his teachings. They probably ate dinner with him. These were two of the disciples. They didn't recognize him. Even when he was teaching them the scriptures, they didn't recognize them. Finally, when they stopped and they were going to have share a meal together, he took the bread and broke it, and they recognized him, Scripture says, in the breaking of the bread. To me, the Catholic world has an Emmaus problem. We all have an Emmaus problem. We know what the Eucharist is, just as they knew Jesus Christ, but we don't recognize really who Jesus is. We don't really understand 
in a way that's going to change our lives. God forbid if I go to, to church on Sunday because I'm a Catholic and I dutifully go to confession regularly and receive communion and I don't try to get closer to Jesus Christ. I don't do everything I can to go deeply into what this is all about. Why are we doing this? I'm doing it because I'm a Catholic. That's what Catholics do. <laughs> There's got to be more than that. Pope John Paul, in this encyclical letter, one of the last documents he left us, he wrote this encyclical on the Eucharist and the church. And in it, he made very clear what he had actually been saying in various documents, various audiences, etc. He gave us his plan for the next thousand years. To contemplate the face of Christ... And to contemplate it with Mary is the program which I have set before the church at the dawn of the third millennium. He doesn't say is a program. He doesn't say it's something I'd like you all to consider. <laughs> he says this is the program that I have set for the church at the dawn of the third millennium. His blueprint for the next thousand years. Now, he had been leading up to this for at least 10 years before the year 2000, which he, which he said had to be an intensely Eucharistic year. If you go back through his writings, his audiences, his talks, it's, it's constant that he's telling us we need to look at the Eucharist. In this encyclical, he talks about the Paschal mystery, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says the Eucharist foreshadowed that event and concentrated it forever. The Paschal mystery, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ never ends. It's been concentrated into the Eucharist. And through the Eucharist, it becomes present to each of us at any time. The thought of this, I'm quoting from him, leads us to profound amazement and gratitude. He goes on. This amazement should always fill the church. Next paragraph. I would like to rekindle this Eucharistic amazement. This is the call of Pope John Paul II. We need to once more as a church and individually to become amazed at the Eucharist. Not just knowledgeable about it a little bit. Amazed because it's so profound. My relationship with Jesus Christ in the Eucharist makes me able to receive personally the benefits of his passion, death, and resurrection. In other words, what he did then becomes available to me now through the Eucharist. And that goes on forever. So what it means is Jesus Christ suffered, died, and rose for you, for you, for you, for me, personally. Catechism of the Catholic Church says Jesus, during his passion, saw each of us, knew each of us, intimately, and died willingly for each of us. Not all of us in a general way. He saw you from the cross. He saw me. Saw all our sin, all our confusion. Loved us. Took all that stuff and died for it so that we can be with him again and forever. That's what the Holy Father is saying we need to be amazed about. I can live my daily life in the reality that Jesus died for me and rose for me through the Eucharist. That's why he left us the Eucharist. He goes on. The church draws her life from Christ in the Eucharist. By him she is fed and by him she is enlightened. 
What he's trying to make clear to us is that you and I, like the church as a whole, draw our life from the Eucharist. Remember when he first gave us the Eucharist? When he first talked about it? Even before the Last Supper? I'm the living bread? You want life in you? You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. If you don't, you don't have life in you. Jesus in the Eucharist is there to bring us a new way of life, daily life. It's supposed to have an effect on us all the time, every day. It's not just something we put away with the Sunday clothes. It's all the time. So his goal basically has become ours. The reason we're doing this is to help fulfill what he set forth in that desire he expressed to rekindle Eucharistic amazement. To rekindle. That's what the church needs. We need to be set on fire again for the Eucharist, for Jesus in the Eucharist. It has to become the center of our lives. The first secret is that Jesus is alive. Oh, gosh, is that all? I'm going home. (laughs) Of course he's alive. We all know that, right? You're a stranger. You walk into a Catholic church, Catholic Church USA, or anywhere else. You walk into a Catholic church, you see a bunch of people sitting there, and at one point, they get up, form a line, walk up, receive what looks like a little wafer, walk back, sit down in their seats. Do you know, as a stranger that they're receiving a person, that that what they're taking in is alive? In the diary of St. Faustina, she records Jesus saying, when I come to a human heart in Holy Communion, my hands are full of all kinds of graces, which I want to give to the soul, but souls do not even pay attention to me. They leave me to myself and busy themselves with other things. They treat me as a dead object. Ouch. Lord God, forgive me for all the times I have walked mindlessly up to communion and received you without even thinking about you and walked back to my seat and got back to the important things in my life. That ring a bell with anybody? God forgive me. God forgive us for any time we have failed to recognize what we're doing. We become creatures of habit. Now I have some ideas about why we become creatures of habit. For many of us, it's because that only happens once a week. We're out of practice. Or even if it happens every day. And now, the rest of my day, well, I got things to do. I got to be busy. I'll see you again tomorrow, Lord. Or I'll see you again next Sunday, Lord. It can't be that way. The Eucharist is the the way that, that God figured out how to stay with us. And how to stay with us in such an intimate way that we could learn to live the way he does we could learn to live with his life in us. If, if you remember the story of Fatima, the angel of peace in 1916, the year before Our Lady appeared to the children in Fatima, the angel of peace appeared. And the third time he came to the children as a way of preparing them, he brought with him the, the host and the chalice, suspended them in the air and prostrated himself on the ground, threw himself flat on his face on the ground to adore Christ in the Eucharist. We can always be prostrate in adoration within, whether we're standing or kneeling to receive communion, regardless of who the priest is who's distributing it, I can be prostrate inside in adoration, recognizing who this is. 
that I'm about to receive. That's the choice I need to make. One of the reasons I think why sometimes the reverence is lacking is words. Words can get in our way. They're helpful, but they can also get in our way. So we hear the body of Christ, the body of Christ, the body of Christ. I don't know about you. When I, when I hear the phrase the body of Christ, I always thought of Christ on the cross. This is not Christ on the cross. The Eucharist is not Christ locked in time, dying or dead on the cross. This is Jesus now. The Eucharist is Jesus who suffered, died, was buried, rose, and is now enthroned glorious in heaven. He is living gloriously in heaven. That's who we receive in the Eucharist, the living God. Catechism of the Catholic Church, under the consecrated species of bread and wine, Christ himself, living and glorious, is present in a true, real, and substantial manner. I want to read you a section from John 6. The Gospel of John, chapter 6, where Christ prefigures what he does at the Last Supper. He, he gives them some advance warning of the institution of the Eucharist and lets us know what it's about. Listen to how precise he is. I am the living bread. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. You think he's trying to tell us something? Every other word is living or life. The whole purpose of the Eucharist, the whole process, Christ, the living God, comes into us to give us his life. So we can live in a new way. So I can live a different way. I need more of his life. I'm reminded of a French author, and I don't remember his name. He was an atheist. But he knew what Catholics believed. And he wrote about how hi hypocritical it seemed to him. He said, if you Catholics really believed what you say you believe, you would crawl on your hands and knees to get to the Eucharist. He knew what we say we believe, that this is the living God who's coming right into us and living within us. And he says, if you really believed that, you would crawl on your hands and knees to get to the Eucharist. We need to start the fire again, relight the fire of amazement and gratitude for what God is giving us here. Secret two. Christ is not alone. Christ is not alone. Maybe you already know this. I never did. I never thought about it actively, but it was like the Eucharist. That's Christ. That's Jesus Christ. Well, that's true. It is. But who's Jesus Christ? Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, took on a human nature, that human nature was fused to his divine nature. That's when he became Jesus Christ. He was always the second person of the Trinity. He was always divine. And then he came and took from the body of a human woman, from Mary, from her flesh, he took a human nature. He's still one person. Now he's got two natures. Two natures. Well, okay, I can, I can understand that, I guess. And so he's, he's human and divine, and he's in the Eucharist. Every time we receive, the priest says, the body of Christ, stop for a minute. And if you're receiving under both species, someone's holding the chalice and says, the blood of Christ, right? The host is the, is the body. The, ch the wine is the blood, right? Wrong. Can you separate Christ's body from his blood? 
This is Jesus Christ. In his glorified humanity, he's with the Father in heaven. He can take his, his blood from his body. Council of Trent definition of the Eucharist is, it is the body and blood, soul. Jesus had a human soul like you and me. And divinity. The body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. That's what we believe as Catholics. Well, I always knew that. I could, I could write that on the theology tests in high school. I always knew that. What does that mean? Body, blood, soul, and divinity. You cannot divide Christ. Where Christ's body is, so is his blood, his soul, and his divinity. I got to tell you this. Two days ago, I was receiving communion, and the Eucharistic minister who was administering the chalice made a mistake. It's never happened to me before. I received the host, walked over to receive the chalice, and the person said, the body of Christ. And it stopped me in my tracks. It was like, and I thought, oh, she made a mistake. She heard the priest saying body of Christ. She just said it, but it, it really is the blood of Christ. No mistake. When the priest says the body of Christ, he could also say, and the blood of Christ, and the soul of Christ, and the divinity of Christ. And the person administering the cup, the blood of Christ, and of course his body, and his soul, and his divinity. Because we cannot divide Christ into parts. Council of Trent. By the consecration of the bread and wine, there's a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord, and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. Oh, that seems to contradict what I was saying, right? Goes on. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 464. This does not mean that Jesus Christ is part God and part man, nor does it mean that he's the result of a confused mixture. You can't divide Christ. Catechism number 1377. Christ is present whole and entire in each of the species. Species meaning the bread and the wine, what looks like bread and wine still. And whole and entire in each of their parts in such a way that the breaking of the bread does not divide Christ. Every tiniest particle of what still looks like bread, every tiniest drop of what still looks like wine is the entire Christ. That's why we can receive under just one species. That's why the normal way in most churches to receive is just receiving the host. Are you just getting his body? No. The priest says that. It's echoing that living symbolism that Jesus used at the Last Supper, which is important. But it's a living symbol. The, the, the host is not just representing Jesus. It is Jesus. And it's not just his body. It's his whole being. Now I want to jump to the other part of that. Body and blood, soul and divinity. And who is Jesus in his divinity? He is one person of three in God. When we receive Jesus, we're receiving Jesus in his humanity and in his divinity, and you cannot divide the Trinity. There is ne is never possible to be in communication in any way with one person of the Trinity without being in communication with all three. So every time I pray to the Father, for instance, I'm praying to Jesus and the Holy Spirit too. They can't be divided. It's a mystery we don't understand in the first place how there can be three persons in one God. But we know they are distinct persons. That's what the church teaches us. And they're distinct in terms of function. But they're all together and cannot be separated or divided in any way. That means where Jesus is, the Father is, and the Holy Spirit is. When you receive communion, you receive the fullness of God. The Trinity comes to dwell in you. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, come to live in you. Now, there's all kinds of disclaimers that I should go through, and I'll go through one quickly. Only Jesus is present sacramentally. In other words, under 
the appearance of bread. But the Father is present with him, and the Holy Spirit is present with him. Theologians use all kinds of terms, but you don't need the terms. The reality is what we all need. We need to know that when I receive Jesus in the Eucharist, the Father comes to me too. The Holy Spirit comes to me too. There's more. There's even more than that. I remember walking down the aisle of the church about to receive communion. I was praying for my father who had died. And uh, I stopped in my tracks. It was like with this awareness, why am I praying for my father? I believe he's in heaven. And I'm about to receive him. Huh? Now at that time, I had no idea that was a correct view. (laughs) It's just something that hit me. When I receive communion... He's with God. I'm about to receive God. What happens when Jesus receives communion? I mean, when we receive communion, when we receive Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. What the, what the church teaches is Jesus is present in the Eucharist as he is in heaven without leaving heaven. Oh, wait a minute. How is he present in heaven? Is he alone? <laughs> is Jesus in heaven alone? Jesus is the king of kings, Right? What king did you ever hear of who travels without his court? Jesus in heaven, we're told, is seated at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit's there. Our Lady's there, body and soul. All the saints have been guaranteed that they're with Jesus now, right? Isn't that our guarantee? If I die in the state of grace, I receive the beatific vision. I go to heaven. What does that mean? I possess Jesus now. I am with him. He's not going anywhere without me. Wherever he is, I am. Anytime I draw close to Jesus, and there's no closer way than the Eucharist, I draw equally close to all of heaven. That makes the communion of saints a pun, folks. (laughs) Right? If the saints are with Jesus, and when I receive Jesus... I'm receiving all the saints too. Now there's a communion of saints. That's really what the church is so united through the Eucharist. Whenever we receive the Eucharist, we enter into communion with the entire Trinity and with all of heaven. I later read in the diary of St. Therese, her remembrance of her first communion. She writes about her first communion, and she mentions that she was just so filled with joy. She was so ecstatic. She was so well prepared to receive the sacrament. And she overheard some of the nuns saying, oh, poor. she was moved to tears. She was crying. She was so happy. She overheard some of the nuns saying, oh, poor Therese, her mother can't be here on this special day for her because her mother had died. And I can almost hear her laughing through her account of this. I'll read this. It was beyond them that all the joy of heaven had entered one small exiled heart and that it was too weak to bear it without tears. As if the absence of my mother could make me unhappy on the day of my first communion. Since all of heaven entered my soul when I received Jesus, my mother came to me too. She knew then she was being reunited with her mother right then when she received. Because all of heaven came to her when she received the Eucharist. That's what we need to recognize more and more and more is how much God has given us in this gift. Secret three. There's only one Mass. Honest to God, there's only one mass. Now, right now, if we could see it, there are probably hundreds, maybe thousands of masses going on somewhere. I mean, at any point of time, there's a mass going on somewhere in the world. There's so many masses going on. But I'm telling you, there's only one mass. There's only one mass. Who's the priest? Jesus Christ. 
Church teaches us Jesus is the high priest, the one great high priest. All other priests, through a special, unbelievable, sacramental identification with Jesus, act in the person of Jesus. But it is Jesus who is the celebrant. And each priest is given this remarkable, unique sharing in that one priesthood of Jesus Christ. You and I, I won't go into this in detail, but you and I also share in that priesthood. We are a consecrated race, a, a royal priesthood. We share in a different way, in the one priesthood of Christ. He's the only priest. Who's the sacrificial lamb? He is. He's the priest and the victim. He, as priest, is offering himself as victim to the Father for you and me. That is the Mass. And I told you before, the Pascal mystery Pope says the Paschal mystery is going on all the time. The, the church teaches, the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches very clearly, the Paschal mystery is the one event that never stops. It's not something that happened long ago. I tend to think that, well, the crucifixion, well, it happened some 2,000 years ago. It's pretty tragic. Whatever. It's, it's an awful thing, but it's over. It's done with. It's not over. It's not done with. Church teaches that the Paschal mystery transcends time. Jesus is forever offering himself to the Father for you and me. And that there's this liturgy going on in heaven all the time. At each event in our time that we call the Holy Mass, what happens is a veil lifts and we join the one eternal liturgy that's going on all the time. Some of you may have heard of Scott Hahn wrote a wonderful book, Supper of the Lamb. Uh, it, a wonderful book. And in it, he makes this point very, very clearly. And this is a quote from him. We go to heaven when we go to Mass. This is not merely a symbol. It's not a metaphor, not a parable, not a figure of speech. It is real. We do go to heaven when we go to Mass. And this is true of every Mass we attend, regardless of the quality of the music or the fervor of the preaching. The Mass, and I mean every single Mass, is heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. Every Mass, no matter how good or bad the outer trappings are for us, at every Mass, something lifts. We come out of time and into eternity. That's why the Mass is the greatest prayer in the world. Because we are allowed to have this real foretaste of heaven. Again, God forgive me for the times I've slept through most of it or been thinking about my taxes or whatever else. While well, God's letting me come right into heaven. When I was first doing this, Father George Kosicki, who's here, will remember this. We were, I was at his hermitage. We, we were, he was saying Mass. I was privileged to be his altar boy. It was just the two of us. It was wonderful. And we had been talking about these things. And we got to the part where the priest says, and now let us join the choirs of angels in their unending song of praise. And we both stopped. It was like, it was like this double eureka. It's not our song. This isn't my holy, holy, holy. We're not having our own little private mass there in his hermitage, and he and I are going to sing holy, holy, holy. We're joining the choirs of angels in their unending song of praise. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. We're in heaven. We're in heaven with the angels. We're joining what they're doing all the time. That's the gift that we have, and it's been kept a secret. There's only one Mass, and it's a heavenly Mass, and every time we have what we call a, a Mass, a celebration of Mass, we're allowed to join that eternal liturgy. Secret four. It's not just one miracle. The Eucharist is not just one miracle. It's a wonderful quote from St. Maximilian Colby, what miracles? Who could ever have imagined such? If the angels could be jealous of men, 
they would be so for one reason, holy communion. Ooh, if the angels could be jealous, what they'd be jealous of is the gift that you and I have, the gift of holy communion, because it's such an awesome variety of miracles. Pope Leo XIII, in his encyclical letter on the Eucharist, wrote, Indeed, in it alone, the Eucharist he's talking about, in the Eucharist alone are contained in a remarkable richness and variety of miracles, all supernatural realities. The Eucharist alone, through a variety of miracles, are contained all supernatural realities. Echoes what we were just talking about. All, you know, we're in heaven. All supernatural realities. The Eucharist alone has it all. Pope John Paul writes, the Eucharistic sacrifice is a single sacrifice that embraces everything. Everything. It is the greatest treasure of the church, an inexpressible gift. The next one is, to me, this secret is just vitally important. Um, it's, we don't just receive. We don't just receive. Again, words. What's the word receive? It's a passive word, isn't it? It's a passive word. I'm receiving. Well, I'm not doing anything. God's doing it all, right? He's doing it. I'm taking it in. I'm receiving. I'm the passive one. Wrong. We're not supposed to just receive communion. We're supposed to enter into communion. What kind of marriage would any married couple have if each one simply received? If I'm going to be passive, I'm just going to receive. To make that marriage work, that relationship work, there has to be active involvement. I have to enter into that relationship. I have to do something to nourish that. It has to be an active entering into that relationship. It's not enough for me to walk up and consume the Eucharist, to consume the host. What's going on in me? That's what's important. This is Pope Benedict XVI. Receiving communion means entering into communion with Jesus. What is given us here is not a piece of a body, not a thing, but him, the resurrected one himself, the person who shares himself with us in his love. This means that receiving communion is always a personal act. In communion, I enter into the Lord who is communicating himself to me. St. Cyril of, of Jerusalem has an image that he uses for what's supposed to happen when we receive. He said, imagine taking melted wax and pouring it into melted wax. What happens? The one interpenetrates with the other so it just forms one liquid mass. When you and I receive, and Jesus pours his whole being, body, blood, soul, divinity, his whole, the whole Godhead, pours him, his, himself completely into us, we're receiving all of heaven, we're supposed to be penetrated through and through with Jesus. Every part of my being is supposed to be mingling with his so that I then become transformed. Again, as I said at the beginning, it's about transforming my life. It's about becoming a, a new person, living in a new way. So I, I can't just receive. I need to enter into the process. The next secret is very similar to this. And it may seem, again, a little obvious, or it may seem like, huh? 
Every reception of communion is different. When I go to communion tomorrow, it can be different than what I received this morning. Because it, what I receive in this act of entering into is totally dependent on my attitude. I'll read a, a quick quote from, from St. Thomas. Because we've seen all this wonderful stuff, right? I've been talking about what God's doing. It's awesome. It's amazing. St. Thomas said, and this is the bad news, in a false person, the sacrament does not produce any effect. What's a false person? We are false when the inmost self does not correspond to what is expressed externally. This is St. Thomas. One is false if in his heart he does not desire this union. He's been talking about the union of us with Christ. And does not try to remove every obstacle to it. Christ, therefore, does not remain in him. Neither does he in Christ. Thomas goes on over and over about this, that the whole thing that Jesus wants to do is unite with us. Melted wax and melted wax. He wants to give us himself completely. If I am not desiring this union, I'm a false person, I get nothing. St. Paul goes further. He says, if you eat and drink body and blood of the Lord without discerning the body, without recognizing who this is, you eat and drink condemnation to yourself. I'm supposed to be receiving, entering into it with a desire to be united with Christ, recognizing what he's offering me. God forgive me, the times I've received communion without actively entering into it, without desiring union with Jesus Christ. I'm not just taking in a wafer. I'm uniting myself with my God. It's an incredible gift. God, forgive me for the times I have not, I have not done that. Even worse, if I've gone when I really should have been to confession first. This is why the church insists that if, that if we have serious sin, we go to confession first. Because of what we're receiving. The amount that I receive of God's being, of his grace, the amount I receive, the benefits that I receive, are totally dependent on my attitude, which means sky's the limit. Every communion can be a better one than the one before it. Every reception can be wondrously different. The next secret is that there's no limit to the number of times you can receive. Wait a minute. You're only supposed to receive once a day unless there's special circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. That's true. That's absolutely true. But what did we just talk about? Receiving. That what you receive depends on your attitude. St. Thomas teaches very clearly that there's such a thing as physical eating, sacramental eating, where I actually receive the sacrament. And when I actually receive, I'm also be, supposed to be receiving spiritually. That's what I just talked about. My heart has to be in it. I need to be entering into this. St. Thomas calls that spiritual eating. And what he teaches is that if I can't eat sacramentally, I can still eat spiritually. And that there are times when my spiritual communion carries as much grace as the sacramental communion. Because it depends on how much I am desiring union with Jesus Christ in anticipation of sacramental communion. Now, all I can tell you is, all my life, I knew about spiritual communion, and I thought, <laughs> oh, hum. And spiritual communion, that's like, like, a, a, like the bonus prize. If you can't receive communion really, then you can do a spiritual communion. Uh-uh. This is real communion. This is real reception There's some teachings from St. Maximilian Colby that are beautiful about this. St. Faustina teaches the same stuff. The church teaches the same stuff. That spiritual communion is vital. Pope John Paul, in his encyclical letter on the Eucharist and in his apostolic letter on the Eucharist, two of the last documents that he left us, 
spends a whole period of time on spiritual communion and how vital it is. It is not enough to receive communion. We have to worship Jesus outside of the Mass, too. And the way we can do that is by uniting us. It can be anything. I'm taking 10 seconds, 15 seconds, a minute, to unite myself with Jesus in the Eucharist and saying, Jesus, I can't, re- I can't be there right now in adoration. I can't receive you right now. Come into my heart. He does. Spiritual communion is so real, it can become a whole way of life. And what it does is it keeps you in a state of communion with God between the times you actually receive sacramentally. It's a way to stay in his presence. I want to give you two things that Pope John Paul left us. One is Eucharistic adoration. To grow, you must adore This is vital. If you read the encyclical letter of Pope John Paul, you read some of the things that that Pope Benedict is saying right now, it's vital that we adore Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, not just during Mass, but outside of Mass. Perpetual Eucharistic chapels, adoration chapels, are, are spreading all around the world, and they have to. The world is going to be changed through Eucharistic adoration, not just when we're receiving communion at Mass, but by adoring Christ in the Eucharist, And it's the way that we become like him. Why do we adore God? Because as we do it, we become like him. His thoughts, his dispositions enter into us. So I just want to leave you with urging you, spend some time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. It will be the best time you have ever spent in your life. The other thing I want to give you to just really get this through is everything I've talked about today comes through Mary. Everything. The teaching of the church on Mary through St. Maximilian Colby, through others, through Pope John Paul, still needs to be unpacked by the church. It is amazing stuff. The relationship. In this encyclical that I that I was reading to you you from, from Pope John Paul, it's six chapters. An encyclical on the Eucharist, the whole sixth chapter is devoted to Mary. And the title calls her the, the mother of the Eucharist, the Eucharistic woman. People were staggered, huh? Even theologians say, he's writing about the Eucharist. Why does he devote a whole chapter out of six to Mary? Because Mary and the Eucharist are inseparable. We need to learn more and more about Our Lady's involvement. I want to give you a parting gift from Pope John Paul in this encyclical. We know at the visitation, at the Annunciation, rather, Mary is there and, and the angel comes and she says her famous, Fiat. What was the angel asking her? The angel was telling her, you are about to conceive in your womb. God is going to take flesh in you. She was the first one, Pope John Paul says, to be asked to believe that God would take flesh in her. And she said, Fiat, let it be done. And Pope John Paul says, there is a profound relationship between Mary's fiat and our amen when we receive. When I go up to the priest and the priest says, the body of Christ, what he is really saying is, do you believe that Jesus Christ wants to become flesh in you, wants to take flesh in you, that the Trinity wants to come and live in you to empower you to live a whole new life? Will you say okay to that? And you say, amen. You are echoing Mary's fiat. She was the first tabernacle. She was the first Eucharistic procession when she went to visit Elizabeth, bearing Jesus in her. She was the first what Pope John Paul and Pope Benedict now have called the living monstrance. In her whole being, she is a monstrance with the Eucharistic Lord going to everyone. You and I are called to that. That's what we're really called to. As we adore Jesus in the Eucharist, as we receive Jesus, we're called to become living tabernacles, living monstrances. When we go to other people, we're supposed to be traveling monstrances, showing Jesus, giving Jesus to them. And when I go to receive, I go up with Mary. Mary, and this is in St. Louis de Montfort, it's in St. Maximilian Colby. Now it's understandable, thanks to Pope John Paul. Why did they say the best way to prepare for communion is Mary? Talk to Mary. She's walking with us. She's helping us to say fiat. I say amen.
fiat, Lord. Let it be done to me, according to your word. Yes, Jesus, take flesh in me. Let me become living Eucharist. That's what we're called to. To be so amazed, so grateful, so conscious of desiring this union with Jesus that we allow him to transform us so that we become like Mary, living Eucharist. So I'm going to close with that thought, that final gift from Pope John Paul. And I'm going to urge you all, if, if this has touched you at all, get the book. It's published by Ignatius Press. You can get it at mercysong.com, the website, mercysong.com, or there's a toll-free number, 888-549-8009. I thank you. And right now, Father, I ask your blessing again on everybody here and everyone listening to this. Keep us all more and more conscious that it's about you and that what you're giving to us in the Eucharist is your very life so that we will be able to live like you and with you forever. Amen. We hope you were inspired by this podcast and we encourage you to share it on social media and warmly invite you to distribute our free Catholic scapulars, medals, books, and booklets to your family, friends, parish, and social groups. Visit us online at catholiccity.com for more information. The real work of the Mary Foundation is accomplished by people just like you. There are three ways to help. First, please pray for everyone who hears, reads, or wears our materials. Second, share them with everyone you know, family, friends, fellow parishioners, and the people you work with. Only you can reach them. Finally, please help us financially. It seems impossible, but we don't do traditional fundraising here at the Mary Foundation. We rely on your generosity and God's providence. By the way, if you, your parish, or your Catholic group would like to distribute our materials by the dozens, hundreds, or even thousands, all we ask for is help covering our materials costs. So please visit us online for suggested donations. For our Canadian friends and those outside the United States, only online requests are accepted, so please refer to the special shipping rates listed on our website. Thanks for listening, and we're looking forward to working with you. May God bless you always. And now, here's a short preview of our Rosary and Divine Mercy Chaplet, the most popular rosary recording in the history of the world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. For an increase in the virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. All rights are reserved, and any duplication without permission is prohibited.